Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to stage three of the Diana Initiative. Woohoo! Uh, my name is Josh. I'm your MC for this uh, talk. And uh, today we're going to be hearing Hello, from everybody. Taylor McClasson. Uh, uh, welcome. Before we do that, I have an announcement to make really quick. Um, our raffle winner for track three is uh, Sydney Brazo. Woohoo! Of applause. You win a, a new car. I actually have no idea what the what the prize is for the raffle, so you'll you'll have to check in with Nicole for that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, congratulations to Sydney. Um, and uh, Taylor, who is with us today, is a multidisciplinary investor, product manager, and technologist living in Austin, Texas. Um, since 2011, he's worked at large scale hyper growth technology companies. Um, he specializes in software as a service products and has experience with data science, machine learning, mobile apps, cybersecurity, web hosting, and web apps. So like everything, basically. Experience with everything. Um, when not advising companies or speaking at conferences about technology, Taylor can be found geeking out with the latest Apple gadget, skiing, or enjoying the expansive Austin art scene. He also enjoys volunteering with local human rights and LGBTQ organizations around Central Texas, as well as mentoring young technologists looking to start careers in tech. Um, and uh, yeah, please give a warm welcome to Taylor. Um, and uh, I will note, uh, for this talk, we will be doing uh, question and answer. Um, please throw your questions in the chat. I will collect them, and then we will do Q&A at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, please take it away, Taylor. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So my name is Taylor McCaslin. Um, you see my Twitter handle there, Digital SaaS. Feel free to tweet questions. Um, or feedback you've got for me at this presentation. Also at the end, there'll be a link to the slides as well. So this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and it's about how we build products that people trust. When we think about technology products, um, they have the opportunity to really allow us to do new things that we were never able to do before. But unfortunately, a lot of technology companies aren't taking that privilege and responsibility to heart and aren't building products that we can trust. So this talk is intended to help you understand how to design privacy, consent, and security into your products so that people love them and use them. So a little bit about me before we get started. Um, I am a senior product manager working in secure at GitLab. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, you will see my Twitter handle throughout this. I've spent most of my career focused on UX at hyper growth enterprise scale technology companies. So that really is the lens through which I think about products. I want them to be easy to use and I want them to be delightful to use. Um, part of that's probably from my strange background. I actually have a BA in theater and dance. Um, so I look at the technology world from a very, very different perspective. Um, I also uh, run a, a small uh, angel investment fund, really focusing on companies who get the, the specifics of what we're going to talk about today right in their products. Um, I also have worked at a number of companies that I'm sure you're probably familiar with there at the bottom. So today I want to talk about what is trust? the types of trust that you can build. I wanna look at why we should care about trust in general. Um, we'll look at a couple of examples that I like to call trust fails. Um, so seeing companies who have failed at building trust with their customers, and then talk about the specifics about what it means to build trust into your products. So to start, let's talk a little bit about the word trust. It's something that it's a very simple word, but it has very complex meanings. Uh, and it's really hard to describe. If you think about trust, it's really, it's just something you, you know it when you feel it. Um, and the way that I like to talk about this is every single day, if you get in a car and you drive on a road, you're trusting that the other drivers are going to obey the traffic laws and understand that you don't cross the double yellow line in the middle of the road. That's you going out on a limb and trusting other people to follow rules. That's kind of what this is about. It's about how people actually think about and present themselves to um, the world and how we think about that trust. So what is trust? If it's hard to define, um, but you can feel it, what are the qualities that make up something that you, you think is trustworthy? 
So I want to talk about this through the lens of two women who've done a lot of work in this field, uh, Frances Fay and Rachel Botsman. Um, both of them have a lot of work on trust. I suggest you go and Google them and look up all of their work. Frances Fay is a, a uh, from the Harvard Business School. She's formerly worked at Uber as their SVP of leadership and strategy, doing a lot to fix the trust problems at Uber. Um, Rachel Botsman is from the University of Oxford. She's also the author of a wonderful book that I highly recommend, Who Can You Trust? Um, I'll talk about some of their perspectives here in just a moment, because I think they each have a unique take on what trust means. Uh, and I think it gives us a framework to look at how we build trust into our technology products. So let's start with Frances Fay. She really approaches the topic of trust in the, the sense of psychological trust, trust between one person and another person. And she thinks of trust as a triangle. If you think about a stool with three legs, that's very much how Frances thinks about trust. And her point in a lot of her talks is that if you don't have one of the legs of this triangle of trust, the whole thing falls down. And those three sides are authenticity, logic, and empathy. And if you're missing any one of these, you can't really establish trust or it doesn't feel completely authentic. So let's talk about what each of these three items mean. So her posit basically is that you're more likely to trust me if the following are true. You feel like I'm being authentic to you, um, that I'm not you know, putting up a facade or saying something that I don't believe is true. Um, you you want to feel like your products are authentic. Second, you want to sense that I have a real rigor in my logic. And what I mean by that basically is that you see how I have come to the conclusions that I have. Um, it's not something that I just pull out of a hat like magic. Um, you want to see that there's some methodology to my logic. And then thirdly, believe that my empathy is directed at you. And this is one of the critical pieces that um, when you talk to someone who's very empathetic, it's really easy to trust those people because you just feel like they care about you. Um, and this is a quality that's really hard to translate into digital technologies, but I think it's one that is really worth looking at. So if those three things are true, you're likely to have trust. Now, I do want to talk one quick bit about rigor in logic. Um, there's a little trick here that a lot of people don't realize. Um, there are sort of two different ways that you can communicate logic and ideas. One of them is uh, I'm going to take you on a journey and I'm going to tell you a story and it's all going to culminate into an idea. In fact, that's a lot of what I'm doing in this presentation today. The second approach is that you start with the idea up front and then you talk people through the journey of how you got there. Both of these are totally reasonable ways to explain how you get to a conclusion and show the rigor in your logic. But there's one trick to this that unfortunately attention isn't unlimited. And so if you go with the first point where you sort of meander around telling a story before you get to your idea, you'll lose people's attention and your idea won't actually come across. This is really important in technology where if you don't help someone accomplish a task immediately or help them understand what you're trying to do, they will leave your product, they won't use it, they will think it doesn't work. So I think it's a really important thing to think through when you think about your technology products. So moving on to Rachel Botsman, she talks about trust more in the sense of communities. So humans to humans rather than a singular person to another person. And in Rachel's book, she talks about how trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. And I think that's a really interesting way to think about trust because it is very much about how do I trust something that I don't understand or I don't fully know. And when you think about technology products, we don't know what's happening in the background. We don't know where our data is going, how it's being accessed, what's happening with it. Um, so it is really building trust with something that is unknown. And so the way that Rachel talks about this is basically through the concept of trust leaps, basically how you go from known to unknown in waters of uncertainty. And that really is what trust is about. It's that what has to be true for you to feel comfortable with something unknown when you have uncertainty about it. So when we look into this, um, 
I, I like to use this reference of, uh, you've probably heard like in 1998, back in the day before the internet got huge, people, your parents would tell you, don't get in the car with strangers. And then fast forward to the internet, our parents would say, don't meet people from the internet alone. And then when you start looking at some of the technology that we've created, like Uber and Lyft, we now summon cars from the internet and get in them with strangers and let them take us places. Um, so it's interesting to look at how trust has evolved and how technology has allowed us to make these trust leaps um, and unlock really interesting capabilities. So the way that Rachel talks about this is what she calls the trust stack. And there's basically three premises to this. One is to trust the idea. You want to believe in whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. In the system of Lyft um, or Airbnb, for example, I'm trusting that I need a ride somewhere and that someone is willing to take, uh, take me there in their car. With Airbnb, I want a cool place to stay. And on the other side, someone has a cool place and they want to offer it to individuals. Um, those are two pretty wild concepts without trust in them. Um, so that sort of steps us up to the next piece is trusting in the platform. I'm not just going to go get in a car with a stranger off the street. However, Lyft and Uber have created a platform where we have profiles and we have ratings and you've got the confidence that there's been some rigor and some thought put into who each of those people are. And you know that there's a rating system um, tied to it. Airbnb is very similar. I'm not gonna go to a random person's house and stay there, but through Airbnb, I can look at ratings and reviews. Uh, hosts can see my profile and see what other hosts have said about me. So you start, build that, you start to build that trust in a platform. And then the third piece is trust in the other users. Once you trust the idea, you trust the platform is a safe place to explore that idea. You then wanna trust that the person that I'm getting in the car with or the, the person whose house I'm staying at in an Airbnb are trustworthy people, that they're not crazy drivers, that they don't have spy cams hidden in their apartments. Um, so those are things that the platforms then have to enable. And in many technology products that comes across in the, the frame of ratings and reviews or user profiles. So you can see how technology products are stepping in to fill in these gaps so that they can help us build trust with unknown parties. Now, the interesting thing, and I kind of touched on this already, is that trust evolves, it changes, it's not a stagnant concept. And this is something that I really like the way Rachel talks about this. So with her concept of trust leaps, if you apply them to different industries like personal transport or payments, you can see really clear leaps of trust as we've expanded our horizon and gotten more trustworthy of unknown contexts. So for example, with personal transport before, you were really limited by how far your horse and your, horse and your cart could travel. Um, you really were in a small community where um, you kind of knew the, the relationships between there. Then we introduced trains where you could cross the country. There's no way you could know about what was happening on the other side of the country. You then see how that grows and adds to itself. You see ride sharing there that we've talked a little bit about. Um, when you look at the payment system before in before proto payments, um, we really had this idea of bartering that I could see that you had a goat and I valued a goat is something that I wanted. Um, so it was easy to barter. Um, we then moved to fiat money and currencies where rather than trading goats or cows or crops, we were instead trading coins that represented value. Um, we've now moved past the point of coins actually having gold backing them in banks somewhere. And now we're using credit cards and digital payment systems that have no tangible aspect in the real world other than we're trading bits between computer systems that we trust respect our net worth and values. So Rachel continues to go on to talk about how this trust evolves. And the way she talks about it, I think is really smart. Um, she talks about local trust is the way that you have to start peer to peer, you then move to institutional trust where institutions like banks and governments sit in between individuals to help connect and provide institutional levels of trust. We're now moving into a more distributed functionality. Uh, this is, I, I always joke that I don't wanna to refer to crypto, um, 
but it's true. Crypto allows us to start doing things like distributed payment systems. Um, credit cards even now have shattered the idea of banks that I don't need a bank to endorse me um, to be able to swipe a credit card to use um, and purchase services. So you can see how that evolution of trust changes. Um, and when you look at these, there's some really unique properties about what it means to have institutional trust and distributed trust. Institutional is opaque, it's closed, it's a centralized system. When you think about a giant bank or a government, it's really unclear how a lot of things work and happen and function in a day-to-day -day, uh, society. It's, it's very top-down. Um, you have to buy into that system and believe that it works. Whereas when you look at something like distributed trust, it's about transparency, inclusiveness, this decentralization. It's very much bottom up. So it's interesting when you're building your technology products to think about what stage of trust are you in and think about the different levers that make these types of trust choices true for your technology product. So the thing that I like about trust in technology is that I believe that technology accelerates the race, the rate of trust leaps and further distributes trust. So we're taking those concepts that Francis and Rachel have talked about and applying them to the speed at which technology evolves. It helps us make those leaps um, to trust platforms that we otherwise would not have trusted before. So now let's jump into the types of trust. So this is a, a framework uh, that was part of a research project from HSBC, which is a bank. Um, as you can imagine, banks are very interested in how they, uh, how their customers perceive them and trust them. Um, this, this survey is from 2017 with 12,000 participants in 11 different countries. So it's pretty wide ranging. I encourage you to go look at this study if you like the framework. So basically they said there's, sort of a quadrant system of what it means to trust something. Um, on the x-axis, you've got long-term trust and temporary trust. Uh, and on the y-axis, you have very deep trust and very shallow trust. And this creates an interesting matrix where you've got things that are short-lived but deep, which are functional. You've got those things that are long-term and deep, which are very much love-related. Um, you've got the shallow but long-term. These are things like necessary needs. And then you've got the shallow and the temporary, which is really lustful types of technologies. So if we think about what are some concepts that we have today, um, not looking at technology, you can start plotting things into this uh, matrix. So if you think about friends and family and loved ones, they are people that you have long-term relationships with and those relationships are deep. They're in that top left corner or of uh, the graph. Um, when you think about experts like your doctors, um, websites that you consult, your smartphones. These are things that are relatively short term in terms of the span of your life, but they're still things that you have very deep relationships with. And then when you look at the shallow but long term, you've got things like governments, work, and financial institutions. And then the fun part is when you get to temporary and shallow, you can start seeing some of the new technology and startups coming there. Things that pop up, they're cool, I try them once and then they die. Um, and it's really the key for these new technologies to figure out as they emerge, how do they move up into that top or right, top right corner of something that forms a long-term relationship with someone and has deep impact on them. So let's go a step further and look at some brands that are actually doing this today. So up in the top left corner, you've got brands like Apple and Samsung who have cultivated this almost cult-like fan uh, base where people just love their products and will go out of their way to use them. When you look at the necessary quadrant, there are things like financial institutions. None of us love our banks. They're there because we need a bank to put our money into. Um, we have shallow relationships with them. They're not things we think about other than it's where my paycheck goes. Um, when you think about the functional area, this is where a lot of technology startups live today. Once they've uh, moved out of the emergent stage, things like Weibo, Google, PayPal, Amazon. These are things that we don't necessarily have a deep relationship and they're not very long term, but they still provide a functional value to us. So think about this framework where your particular technology product might actually fall in this system. So why do we care about this? What actually is worth 
thinking about trust with our technology products. This is a survey again from that HSBC survey where basically they asked uh, millennials, Generation X and baby boomers about what percent of their daily lives they were concerned about. And what's really interesting about this, first of all, as you'll notice, there's not really a ton of difference between the different generations. But one of the things I like to, to focus on is if you look at the areas with red, they're the areas where technology is causing concerns for these people in their daily lives. Personal data being leaked, that's a big problem in the technology industry. Bank account hacking, debit card cloning, identity theft, email scams, these are all problems that technology have enabled. And now they're part of the largest percentage of our concerns day to day. This for me as a product manager and as someone who builds technology and believes that technology can create great change in the world, this concerns me. This is not that vision of how technology can change the world for the better. Instead, this is causing a lot of worry and anxiety for people. I want to see this change. So technology distrust is causing much of the daily worry that we have. And to me, that's something that it doesn't have to be that way. With a little bit of intention and a little bit of responsibility, we can really make an impactful change here. So let's take a look at a couple of companies that have done this wrong. So these are what I call trust fails. And there's a really great website here that has a ton of data breaches and hacks. So if you go to that website, and this is actually a trust of or a test of your trust in me, will you visit that bit.ly link that I've provided there? I promise it just goes to the information is beautiful website, which has a really cool infographic that you can explore and look into. Um, we'll talk about a few of these examples, but already you can see the scale, the scope, the severity of the data problems that we have in technology is purely behind technology companies just not being responsible for the data and the technologies that they create. I want to see this change. So let's start with the obvious one. We've all heard about Equifax. We've all probably had to deal with freezing our credit reports. One of the largest sensitive data breaches um, that happened in 2017. Um, I won't spend much time here, but lots of data was uh, compromised in this um, breach. Um, and I think this was the moment where we finally realized like the scale at which this can happen can be really wide ranging. Uh, let's look at something a little more sensitive, though. Um, so I am an openly gay man. Um, there is an app called Grindr, which is basically for you to connect with other LGBTQ individuals. Um, it's a hookup app, let's be frank. Um, the technology behind it, though, um, provides you to do some interesting things like remind people to get tested for HIV. And unfortunately for Grindr, they had a third party data leak where not only could someone track a person's individual geo GPS location, but they also could access data about their HIV status um, and could access that information in unsecured API calls. This is hugely problematic. So you take an app that's intended to connect an at-risk minority group and then don't put the correct privacy controls in place and don't take responsibility for the data you're collecting, you're putting people at real risk. For example, if I were to travel to countries where I could literally be put to death and my location can be easily found and health data around uh, my HIV status could be exposed, we're talking about legitimate safety concerns for me, as well as potential impacts to my insurability as a person um, if data about my health status were to be uh, leaked in a way that I couldn't control. Um, so these data breaches are really sensitive and our technology products are just causing us to put more and more data out into the world. And in some cases, data that we don't even realize is leaving the safety of our own devices. If we look at Facebook, we've all heard about the Cambridge Analytica um, breaches where basically Facebook didn't put the correct controls around the data they collected. So a company called Cambridge Analytica scanned Facebook profiles for what is called uh, psychographic data to profile people. And then that was used by 
Russia to influence the US election. Of course, this is an election year in the United States. And again, this becomes a really interesting um, and concerning problem about how accessible our data is on the internet and how that can be used to manipulate us. Continuing on with Facebook, um, they also have other issues. So they've got a, a product called Portal, which is basically a video camera that will follow you around as you move. Um, and when they released this, pro this uh, hardware project, I think it's a really cool concept. Um, but when they released it, even their executives and their uh, privacy policies didn't make it clear if Facebook could use the audio in the video that it was collecting um, in those video calls to do ad retargeting to you. Um, an example of how a technology company created an interesting and novel technology, but then didn't put the correct controls around it to create that cycle of trust um, where people would actually use this. I personally will not be purchasing a portal device, much less putting it in my home and letting Facebook collect all of that data. Continuing on, there was a Pew Research study done specifically on Facebook and trust, and they found that only 6% of adults trusted Facebook. 60% said they don't trust Facebook to protect their data at all. And three quarters of adult Facebook users have taken some action to curtail their Facebook use. This is a great example of how if you don't build trust with your customers, or if you actively break trust with your customers, they'll go do something else. Um, this is where trust actually turns into very real financial concerns for your business. Um, I laugh at this photo every time it circles around social media. So this is Zuck in his office. Um, joking, but if you zoom into his computer there in the bottom left corner, you'll notice Zuck himself doesn't even trust the camera and the audio ports on his computer. Um, this is one where if even a billionaire who runs Facebook doesn't trust the hardware and the systems that even his company helped build, how, does, how can any of us individually have any chance at securing ourselves and our data? Um, Amazon itself has struggled with some privacy concerns. There was a very strange story about a Portland couple who were having a private conversation in their living room and then got a phone call from their friend who said basically the Alexa device was streaming their conversation to her Alexa device. Um, basically, in their conversation, Alexa had misinterpreted some of the wording um, as signal words and then started a connection call. Um, that feature of Amazon Echo was actually on by default for customers and it wasn't until recently that they had changed that and made it an opt-in feature. So an example of rolling out new and novel functionality that some people might use but by turning it on by default creates this opportunity for people to have things happen that they don't expect. Um, Alexa and Amazon have moved forward on other interesting devices like this ring device and sunglasses um, that have Alexa built into them. So now it's not even just a stagnant hardware device in a home. It's things that can be anywhere on a person um, live and recording conversations and doing who knows what with them. Um, so it's interesting to see how these technology companies really have to grapple with concepts of trust. So that brings us to what does it mean to build trust in tech products? Um, so going back to our framework from the bank, um, if we look at some of the technology concepts that we've got, it, and we, we touched on some of these earlier about how um, brands that can engage fans create this like uh, diehard fans who go out of their way, who stand in line for days and weeks to purchase the new uh, devices that come out. Um, those are like concepts of love. Um, you've got someone, you've created technology that people love so much that they go out of their way to go and get it. When you think about functional items like our phones and even our wearables, these are devices that we wear on our person and have on us at all times. Um, they're very personal, uh, but they're devices that when the next one comes out or when the screen breaks on this, uh, they're gone and you move on. Um, when you look at the necessary um, 
section, you've got things that are high switching costs. Uh, banks, again, are a good example of this. Nobody wants to go and switch banks because it's a pain to do. Um, creating a new account, moving money between it, changing all of your paycheck uh, ETFs. Uh, it's just something where it's not a very deep connection, but because of high switching costs, we let it be long term. Uh, things that are in the necessary column tend to not be things that are super trustworthy or have much thought put in them because they know that you can't go anywhere and that it's a pain to do. We're seeing technology change some of that. Um, and then the, the lust uh, category, you see things like low value luxury items, handbags, um, as seen on TV type products. And when you think about all of these different types of technologies and how they impact our world, there are ways that you can break trust with these things. So when you think about this, think about things like scandals or betrayals. For people you love, a betrayal could break that trust. For companies that you love their products, for example, I'm a big Apple fan. If Apple had a giant privacy scandal, I might be less willing to be a fan of Apple products. Um, when you look at functional items, it becomes much more about breakage or fading fads. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about um, not the Apple Watch, but the, uh, the fitness band. Um, one of the companies basically was aggregating fitness data and they released a blog post that basically said, huh, really weird. Uh, in time adjusted data, we've noticed that around seven or eight o'clock in the evening, there's a lot of activity. Um, and then they wrote a blog post about people having uh, sex. Um, that's not how I want my personal data to be used, even in an aggregated form. It feels invasive. Um, and with these devices that literally are on our bodies, that are listening to our heart rates, that are listening to audio or recording video in the room, they're very sensitive things. And when something that we don't intend to be, be public becomes public, that's a moment of broken trust. Um, so lots of different ways that you can fail at trust, but there's a lot of things that you can do to actually build it. And I believe that trust can be a fundamental differentiator for technology products. And we'll look at a couple of examples of technology companies that get this right um, and use it as a core differentiator for their products. So we've talked a lot about what trust is, how do you build it? Um, between people and between communities, but what about humans and machines? As we're building these technology products, how do we help individual people who may not be super technical understand how the systems that we build and the technology products that we release work in a way that they actually trust them? Um, and so I wanna take us back to Francis and Rachel's frameworks of building trust through authenticity, through empathy, through logic looking at Rachel's framework for adding competence, reliability, and honesty into our products and what that actually looks like in practice. So to start, I wanna talk through a few examples of technology products that actually do a good job of this. And you'll notice this is a bit in conflict with some of the privacy problems that I mentioned earlier. But one thing that the Amazon Echo device does do is that it's very clear when it's on. When Alexa is listening, the blue light is on and it lets you know that it's listening. Um, that's a really great example of using technology like the light up ring around the edge of the device to make it extremely clear how technology is functioning. Um, when you've got it muted, it's turned red and you've got a good sense that the device is not listening. Uh, we can go into the problems about do you actually trust the hardware behind all of this and that the lights actually mean what they think they do. Um, but having clarity in the technology that's super clear that even a child can understand if your listening device is actually listening or not is really clever. Consistency is another way to build trust with people. Um, I, I look at this from the Apple human interface guidelines where providing consistent messaging helps build and train people with how to interact with your technology product. It doesn't matter what this modal says at all. I know the default action is the blue button and it's probably what triggered the action that I'm trying to accomplish. Um, it's this consistency that allows you to start understanding and feel like you've got control in a system. Um, if every single modal that popped up looked different and had different button styles, 
it would be a lot harder and take a lot more cognitive load to understand how that technology product functioned. The next one is proof value. So with technology products, they're very fungible. Unless they're accomplishing something for us, we're gonna move on and use something else. So in your products, make it clear what value you're creating for your users. Um, one of the things, a great example of this, I think is my Apple Watch. Um, at the end of the day, I always check my activity rings to see how I'm doing. Um, and if I'm having a, a lazy day, my watch will tap me on the wrist and say, hey, stand up. Um, Go do act, something active. Um, it's a way where you can be validated with the technology and how it's helping you improve your life in some way. The next one is a, a fun little story about building common sense. Um, there are some major travel platforms and there's a fun story about a company where someone typed into a travel search engine uh, trip to Paris and what they intended was a trip to Paris, France, as most of us, I assume, would think the word Paris would mean. Instead, the tool provided them uh, information about a trip to Paris, Texas, um, which is not as glamorous as Paris, France, and is almost certainly not what that user was trying to accomplish. Um, because they were in a rush or for whatever reason, they ended up buying the tickets to Paris, Texas, rather than Paris, France. Um, it's an example of where just with a little bit of intuition and common sense, you can make your technology products seem smarter and actually help users accomplish what you intend to do. So let's recap some of the things that we've talked about. These are very much educational related things. Prove your product's competency and show your logic. Make it clear what's happening and why. Set expectations along the way um, to help give people a sense of what you're actually accomplishing with your technology product. Explain and prove value. Um, you've probably heard the term of a 10X technology product. That's something that you're willing to use it because it makes the experience 10X better than what it is today. Um, I think this is one when you look at things like productivity apps, um, do they make your accomplishing tasks and goals 10X as easy as just writing down a sticky note with um, check boxes on it? Probably not. And that's why I've never found a productivity tool that works better than my sticky note system. Um, next, build consistency. Consistency builds confidence. And it, even if your product isn't fully fleshed out, if it's consistent, I have a sense as a user of how it works. And that helps build that consistency or that helps that build that confidence for me. Um, also be relevant, contextualize those interactions. If I'm searching a travel website for Paris, assume I mean Paris, France, not Paris, Texas. Build in those common sense um, gates to help people understand what you're trying to accomplish. And again, like I mentioned earlier, simplicity wins. Um, one of my favorite things is to see Alexa devices with these red circles on because it's super clear what the intention of the device is at that time. It's not listening to what you're doing. Um, and I think it's very hard to get simplicity that's so simple, a child can understand that when the light's red, it's not listening. And when it's blue, it is. Let's talk about design empathy for a moment. So this is a screenshot from the Spotify app from a few years ago. Um, I was trying to play some music and I, I literally have no idea what's going on here. I don't know why it's not playing music. It's given me no information about why it can't play the song that I've chosen. Um, build empathy into your designs. As it turned out, I had a VPN turned on at the time. Um, because I was traveling and my VPN had disconnected from the internet. Nothing about this error screen helps me as a user understand why this app is not functioning the way I want it to. Provide context and design empathy with your users. It'll build that trust with them. This is very frustrating, but had it just said, can't connect to the internet, that's something that can cue me into what's wrong and how I can go about fixing it. Next is building in helpful tooltips. So this is a feature that, that MailChimp added to their sign-in form. Um, and they found that users were, were struggling logging into the right account. So they put in this 
warning message about, hey, we can't find the account that you mentioned that you're trying to log into here. Now, before all of the security people say, oh my God, you can't do that. You're gonna expose account information and you create an enumeration mechanism to determine if someone has an account or not. Behind the scenes, MailChimp has implemented web application firewalls, rate limiting and other secure technologies to not show this message to um, things like bots or scrapers that are hitting this page frequently. Um, they've put technology protections in place, allowing them to expose usability friendly uh, options to help users get logged into their accounts. Um, and I think what's really cool about this is they've taken a technology um, problem and turned it into a real value proposition. Not only does this help the user get access to their account, but it also gives MailChimp really great uh, telemetry data about attackers who are trying to enumerate accounts. That's something their fraud or abuse team can take action on. Yeah, so we talked about that. Um, the next piece is automatically updating. Part of the cool thing about technology products is you can have them auto update. While I don't like Google Chrome, it does get auto update right. Um, I don't have to think about Chrome being up to date. It automatically updates in the background, helping take some of the load about updating technologies off the plate of the user is a way to help you uh, build trust with them. Um, but you've still got to be able to handle problems and errors. Um, in a recent uh, press release or a press conference that Amazon did for some new Alexa devices, they wanted to introduce the concept of helping people understand why Alexa did something wrong. Um, so you can actually ask your device, why did you do that? And it'll explain what happened that caused that trigger. Um, many of the devices now allow you to look at trigger words so you can understand why something has um, turned on or turned off. So a, a fun story here is when you think about failed interactions in human space in reality, in IRL, um, interactions are one off. When you go to a restaurant and you have a bad experience, you don't apply that to the entire restaurant or to all restaurants in the world. Instead, you say, I want to talk to a manager to make this right. Um, with technology products, you don't get to talk to a manager. You have to put your best foot forward. And if you fail at that, you can really damage a brand. As we saw earlier with Facebook, the damage has been done with people trusting them and people are looking to other technologies other than Facebook. So with some of these concepts, this is really about building security into your apps. It's about building reliability and empathizing when things go wrong. So make sure that your product does what it promises. Ask for consent before you collect data secretly. If you do collect data, secure the data that you're entrusted with. And if you don't have the security investment to be able to protect that data, don't collect it. Um, make security easy, set smart defaults, and handle problems. Empower users rather than, fit, than blame them when something goes wrong. Help them fix problems and it'll create technology that your customers are more likely to trust and use. So let's keep looking at some examples of this. So Apple gets transparency and consent really right. Um, they're a privacy-minded company. In fact, that's why I feel comfortable wearing an Apple Watch on my wrist all the time. That's why I have all my Apple devices because it's a company I trust with my data. Um, their privacy page is top notch. I highly recommend you go to apple.com slash privacy. They talk you through how they've built privacy and consent into their technology. In fact, I love this icon of two people shaking hands because that is really what trust is about. It's about um, understanding each other and what you're trying to accomplish. Next is privacy controls. If you go into the settings app on your Twitter application, you'll notice there's lots of different settings. Um, and what's cool about this and what I like about the way Twitter has done this is they've put real context and given you control about how your data is used. Um, if you haven't, go take a look at those privacy controls and think about how you could apply them to your technology projects. Um, then we've got the fun one. We've got Google, um, who on their privacy page lead with the top header, we do not sell your personal information to anyone. And I know technically what they're trying to say here, 
But no one would agree with this statement at all. Google is absolutely using your data to sell ads, um, which while not maybe exposing or selling your information to third parties, they're providing access to your data um, so that they can sell ads. Um, definitely be really cognizant about the messaging of your technology products. Um, here's a fun app that I actually really like. Um, it's called Sleep Cycle. Um, but what you'll notice there in the middle is that link icon with the name Emil. Emil was one of my coworkers previously, and we were um, at a convention in a hotel, and this app has the concept of a partner link that broadcasts your device name on the network that you're on so it can pair with your partner and cancel out movements in your, your bed. Um, I do not share a bed with my coworkers. Um, I was alone in a hotel room using a VPN, and yet this um, was broadcasting Emil's device to mine and mine to his. Um, they have since added uh, this feature, with, which was on by default previously. They now have a modal that lets you opt into this feature and explains it to you. But this was really terrifying to me the first time. Um, anybody could have used this app to enumerate if I was on a network somewhere actively sleeping. Um, next, you've got things like smart defaults. Um, if you've never looked at your uh, options in your iPhone, um, go to settings, face ID, and passcodes, and take a look at how much data you're allowing to be accessed when your phone is locked. Um, this is a view of what my settings are, and I encourage you to potentially adopt some of these settings to reduce the amount of data that you're allowing someone to have access to when your device is locked. Um, here's an example of where, with Apple's approach to privacy, privacy is still really hard to get right. In their new uh, OS releases, they require additional security permissions to give applications access to your data. And unfortunately, the way this was implemented creates this nightmare of pop-ups and modals that are really hard to understand. When I upgraded to this version, this is an actual screenshot of my system and all of the um, uh, privacy prompts that. Uh, were brought up. This is a lot of work for me as a user to have to think through what I'm approving. So think about the user experience of those solutions. So in recap, be honest and act with authenticity with your technology products. Um, be transparent with the data that you collect and use. Provide smart controls and consent and, and, and controls for people to consent or object to collecting data. Handle when people opt out of providing data. Um, set smart privacy defaults. Don't auto opt people into new features that might have privacy concerns to them. Explicitly let people know when behaviors or features change in a way that might impact their privacy. And I think finally to close this out, go and talk to actual people who use your technology. The things they will tell you will blow your mind. Um, just having a conversation about how they use your technology will open a brand new door of all of the different things that you, can, you should consider as you're building trust into your technology products. Um, and really listen, deeply empathize with them, ask why. Ask them why again, um, really get to the heart of their questions and the ways that they're using your technologies. I promise you, if you do five of these sessions, you will be shocked at the things you'll learn um, from your users and how they think about and use your technology products. So that closes us out today. I think that while building trust isn't easy, it's how you can set yourself apart and really differentiate your products. Um, that concludes my talk today. If you'd like to see the slides or dig into some of the examples, um, you can find the slides at that link there. So I think it's time for questions. Awesome, thank you very much, Taylor. That was an excellent talk. Um, so I was able to collect one question. And uh, so how accountable is distributed trust if that distribution makes attribution potentially more difficult? And I'm, and I'm assuming attribution of like uh, an account to a person. So uh, the way that I'll talk about this is that when you think about um, the way that Rachel talked about trust leaps, part of the problem with technology is that as we're adding new concepts like distributed trust, um, 
we introduce these new types of problems um, about how you think about some of these um, distribution and consent mechanisms. Um, part of the, the point about privacy is that you shouldn't have enough data to be able to go and make some of these concerns. So you've got to think about in your product, what is it that you can do? How do you collect data in a way where you don't need to know the specifics, but that you can take action on those types of things? Um, we're still very new with a lot of these distributed concepts. Um, Strangely, we're breaking some of that uh, down in things like cryptocurrency. Um, we're already seeing like the US government have to grapple with how do you do taxing on a cryptocurrency that's completely anonymous. Um, as you remember, uh, Twitter recently was um, had a security incident where people were posting crypto addresses on public figures, even pro uh, political figures, Twitter accounts. And it's a, a strange thing to grapple with about you've got this attack framework where people have complete anonymity, but that you can still gain context and pieces of information to piece that story together. Um, I still don't really believe that anything is private these days. Um, even if you're using crypto or whatever VPN, like there, you still leave digital footprints. Um, so I think it's about thinking when you're building your products, what data are you collecting? Where is that data going? How are you using that data? Um, and how can you have as little data as possible? Um, the way that I think about this when I talk with my technology teams is if we don't absolutely need the data to accomplish whatever it is we're trying to do, don't ask for it. It's one other thing we have to secure and protect. It's more storage we have to pay for. It's more security that we have to protect things with. Um, and if it doesn't really provide value for the product that we're offering, why collect it? Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Taylor. That was an excellent talk. Let's give a round of applause, virtual round of applause. Thanks everyone. Feel free to tweet your questions at me. Um, and again, the slides are there at that link. I'll tweet that link as well. Um, thanks for your time today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, Diana Initiative virtual conference. Cool. See you, Taylor. Bye.